Okay. Um, now, I left off yesterday uh, and we were playing around with a uh, virtual machine. Sorry, mate, I'll disturb you. Uh, and we created a, the, the most basic of uh, virtual machines. Okay, so. Uh, uh, so we created it using this very, very simple bang file, which just creates the bento box. Now, uh, in the actual courses I'm developing, I will go through in painstaking detail how I developed the next step. Um, but I'm going to skip all of that. Um, I'm going to actually get rid of this demo directory. Uh, and instead, I'm going to use one I prepared earlier. Uh, specifically, uh, this, which is the beginnings of a developer virtual machine. Uh, now, although uh, this is uh, a little way down in terms of describing how it all works, what I'll do is I'll, I'll get it and then we can um, discuss what it does. Okay, so if I just clone this, uh, so now we've now got this uh, developer VM. which has got the Vagrant file and it's got these provisioning scripts, uh, core and vagrant setup. Uh, so what I'll do is um, before actually running vagrant for the first time, uh, let's take a quick look at the vagrant file. Uh, so it, it's not that different from the one we've just looked up. Okay, it, first of all, it sets up uh, the vagrant default box, which is the same. It's the Debian 10 box, and all I've added is these provisioning sections. Okay, so the first one uh, at the first pair, uh, so this line, uh, all it does is copy anything from the provisioning directory inside our current project uh, from the host up to the new. Uh, Bento Debian 10 box uh, into the temp provisioning directory. Uh, the next command simply executes uh, uh, two commands. Okay, so it does a two mod x to make sure. Whoops. Uh, okay, that wasn't quite what I wanted, but it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, so the next line, uh, this one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so this line, uh, no, try again. Uh, this line, uh, what it does is it uh, makes sure that the scripts within that provisioning directory are executable. Now, it's debatable whether it's better to mod everything within the git repository and then copy it up with those attributes or whether to mod it once it's in there. Mm. I'll have to do it once it's in there uh, because it makes it clear uh, and if I forget to mod it and commit it, it doesn't matter. Um, but mm, it's a matter of taste. Uh, it, it also depends, by the way, on whether you're getting these things from a trusted source or not. Because obviously, if you're getting them from an untrusted source, then I would definitely do it this way, and I would be very selective about what I show modded. Uh, in fact, I would do it slightly differently. Because what I would do is I would take away executable from everything from the untrusted source, and then only give executable to those things that I really did trust. Uh, on the basis that that would then stop somebody from nefarious uh, uh, nefarious addition uh, to um, you know whatever I was working on. Uh, if you then did a, like a, a git pull or something like that, you might get scripts that you didn't expect. Um, so yeah, doing it this way slightly more uh, secure. Uh, Anyway, uh, assuming that that mod works okay, what we do then is we execute a very specific script called core, uh, and we let it do its magic. Right? Now, the next few lines, uh, okay, now these lines, 
uh, in particular. Uh, are interesting insofar as what I've allowed is within the developer virtual machine setup, okay, there are basically two parts. There's the parts which we want to set up on all of our developer machines, okay, and then there's the part where we say, well, okay, but the developer might provide their own setups, so they might have their own personal preferences about the way things are done, and for that, we have the personal installs. Okay, and for that, we look for a file called main in a personal installs directory. And if we find it, we basically do the same thing. We move it up, make it executable, and then run it. Uh, okay, so, uh, right. so that's all that does. Now, you'll notice that in core, uh, sorry, in provisioning, there are actually two scripts, and we've only called one core. So let's have a look at provisioning script core. Okay, so in here, uh, in fact, let's, let's do it with the. Uh, uh, okay, so in here, uh, it's it's a fairly basic script okay all, all it does uh, there's no real magic here okay so we set our normal error handling conditions although i suspect i suppose we could put the pipe fail on there as well but anyway um this just gets the directory of the currently executing script uh, this makes sure that uh, the apt get instructions don't ever expect us to actually interact with them so um, although we put minus y on a lot of things to say answer yes uh, even when we do that, there are some scripts that are expecting further interaction with certain things. Um, and to prevent that, uh, setifying Debian front end to be non interactive should mean that none of the install, the package installations, should expect us to interact with them in any way. They'll just accept any default values. Okay. Uh, then we've got a series of functions which we'll come back to. And then at uh, the last, we just call each of those functions. Now, this is uh, my preferred way of structuring my scripts. Okay, we could have just put all of these instructions in here in sequence, and it would have worked just fine. Okay, but by doing it this way, it's a little bit more descriptive, and I don't need to put lots of comments into my script. I, you know, the the functions become the comments. Okay, so you can see. What the script does is it updates the existing passages, then it installs the developer tools, then it installs the Py environment prerequisites, and then it installs the developer environment. Right? And then we look at each of these, and we can see updating the existing package just does the update and upgrade. Uh, then the developer tools, it installs Git, Vim, Tmux, Python 3, uh, and that's it, because I'm expecting to do some Python development in this environment. Uh, now. It's debatable whether things like, um, in particular, things like Vim and Tmux really belong in there. Uh, you could make a case that they should be put in the developer's personal installs. Why? The editor you, you use and whether you use a, a multiplexing uh, terminal multiplexer is a matter of personal taste. Um, it's not something that necessarily we want to enforce as it happens because this course is going to include a certain amount of vim tutorials and tmux tutorials it's worth installing them here uh, but in an ordinary developer vm it's questionable whether you'd want to do that uh, you leave it up to the developers um, also uh, as it happens um, uh, things like vim are already installed anyway Okay, Git on the other hand, uh, you could almost certainly put that in as a standard because if all your repository management is done through Git, stands to reason developer VM needs it. Right? So there's a sl there's a fine distinction between what you should put in as a matter of course and what you should put in uh, uh, or what you should allow developers to choose. And I think things like editor and multiplex are, are certainly things that yeah you could leave to personal choice uh, the pion prerequisites this is because um, when we come to do the vagrant setup which we'll come to shortly we need a whole load of stuff like the c compiler and various other bits and pieces in order to uh, install pion correctly 
uh, and those prerequisites generally need to be installed as a privileged user so we run those here anticipating this next step which is to install the developer environment okay uh, ignoring for a second that that is actually redundant at the moment uh, although I think the intention originally was to set it to this directory here uh, oh, uh, we'll, we'll leave it for now so what's going on here well core is being run as the root user because that's the default when uh, vagrant runs okay so what this does effectively is change it so it's now running in the context of the vagrant user and we run the vagrant setup in that context why uh -huh. if we look at uh, the provisioning vagrant setup script okay so this is run in the context of the user uh, namely vagrant okay um, if you were setting this up for a user user would you use the vagrant account yeah, sure why not uh, most of the stuff downstream is going to be set up by for example the git configuration and so on well that doesn't have to be vagrant it can be the real developer whatever his name and whatever his account is okay um, but for the purposes of this exercise uh, we'll just leave it as vagrant so you'll see it's the same basic structure uh, the only difference is that um, where we've got install pyenv, install poetry uh, and uh, source the profile and batch uh, this one line is outside of a function and that's because it's a prerequisite for most of the other things and frankly it's fairly benign um, what it does is it looks for a bash profile file and if it doesn't find one uh, it creates it uh, with with uh, sort of a single line of contact to say this is a batch file uh, this is my way of dealing with the problem uh, of which uh, which scripts get run in which context uh, there's a difference between where um, uh, bash profile gets used and bash rc gets used and dot profile gets used uh, and more often than not it's the bash profile which is going to get executed um, but in order to make sure that everything works i simply call profile and bash rc from within the bash profile why well partly it's to sort of uh, make sure that every well it's entirely to make sure everything gets set up now some uh, installation scripts actually inject stuff into your bash rc or your um, dot profile uh, and if it gets injected into the wrong one um, uh, wrong one in the context of uh, you running a bash uh, shell script uh, a bash shell uh, then it can cause problems so just to alleviate that problem since we know that when a bash shell is run bash profile will definitely be run we make sure it runs the other two that's all it's not particularly complicated uh, it just makes sure it gets done and that's what this is all about okay so what this is doing and it, uh, okay <laughs> it's worth explaining these so let's, uh, let's go through them one time. okay so install pyenv right so you can see it first looks to see whether there is a pyenv hidden directory in my home directory uh, and if there isn't uh, then we clone the pyenv uh, repository into it uh, the next one to three lines okay i know there are four here but uh, they're continued lines okay uh, so the next three instructions are all said commands now why is this so complicated uh, well first of all i would argue it's not that complicated once you understand what it's doing um, but importantly we want our provisioning scripts to be what is called idempotent okay you'll come across this word from time to time idempotence is simply the idea that if i run a script multiple times or, or any command multiple times i would expect the outcome to always be the same uh, uh, this is uh, an idea from uh, 
well, uh, it's not really from, is it? Yeah. But it's an idea that's used in functional programming um, that, given the same context, the same inputs should always produce the same outputs. Okay? Uh, and that's what we're endeavoring to make sure of here. Okay, so these said commands are all checking whether or not certain lines are present. If they are, then we don't do anything. If they're not, then we make sure that they get fixed up. So, for example, uh, the minus i is simply saying edit in place. Okay, and the thing that we're editing in place is is, is this file here. Oops. Uh, is this file here? Okay, the bash profile in this particular command. All right. So what we're there, what we're doing then is we're running two commands, uh, each of which is preceded by this minus e. These are said commands. Okay, editor commands, if you will. So we're saying if you find a line that begins with export pyenv root equals home pyenv. Okay, bearing in mind that home will be expanded. Uh, actually, uh, oh no, sorry, uh, pi won't be expanded because we've got the backslash in there. Okay, then just quit. Okay, so that makes sure that if this line already exists in the file, we're not going to do anything. If, however, that one doesn't match, then we carry on and we do this one. And what this says is, okay, append to the end of the file the line that we just said we were looking for. Okay, so you can see the first time we run this, it'll add that line. The second time, it won't add it because this will match and said we'll just quit and it will never add that line. And we did the same thing for pi and root uh, slash bin uh, being added to path. Uh, in actual fact, we could actually be cleverer about this, but let's not. Um, and then we do the same thing with this pi and init. Okay, which just makes sure that pi and visual are ready, up and running. Um, each time we log in okay and then this next section so so that's pi and setting up pi and right uh, the next section says well okay we're going to install poetry so the first thing we do is say well, okay is the poetry command already installed if it is uh, then uh, don't do anything else if not then we curl uh, get poetry pi into Python. Okay, so this effectively says run this command uh, in the context of this user. Now, again, if you're working from trusted sources, if you know that nothing is going to, for example, intercept and whoops, uh, intercept, oh, come on, Mark, intercept and redirect this uh, uh, URL. Okay. Uh, to something malicious, then you're good to go. Yeah, you know, use this form. Uh, failing that, you should really do this as a two-step process, and you should have some way of validating that getPoetry.py is what you expect it to be. Like, for example, a checksum. Um, but we do trust uh, we do trust this source, GitHub get, get user content. We do trust it, and uh, we don't expect that any of our, for example, DNS name resolvers will be compromised, so we can just use this directly. Uh, add, add to that the fact it's also HTTPS, which makes intercepting it even harder. Okay, uh, and finally, we do, once again, we do that said magic uh, to add the .poetry env uh, source, uh, which makes sure that the environment for Poetry is set up. Right, now then, source profile and bash. Right, so this is doing that exactly the same uh, said magic to make sure that um, bash profile calls profile and then bash rc. Right. Uh, so that's it. Uh, it's not that complicated. And then exit zero, just make sure we, clean, we cleanly exit. And that is it for now now obviously we will extend that as and when we need to so let's see what we get let's make it up
Now, it has to be said that this is the very <laughs> this is the very beginnings of of uh, the uh, developer virtual machine for let's call it the salty vagrant team. Um, so uh, this is just laying the groundwork. Okay, uh, the next thing we're going to look at is laying the groundwork for uh, building out. Uh, the virtual machine that we're going to use to replicate uh, as best we can in our development and test environments uh, the the environment for the thing we're going to build okay so for the start uh, we're going to replicate two machines uh, on the local area network one of which is going to act as a general purpose server and one of which is going to act as our uh, router uh, let's call it our network machine so it's going to act as a router it's going to act as a dhcp server uh, we're going to stick a name server on there and various other bits and pieces okay now those two the, both of those machines are going to live on uh, the local network in fact i've actually got the hardware sitting out there ready to go uh, but neither of them are particularly powerful machines we don't need them to be for the purposes of this exercise okay uh, all we want to do is we want to as closely as possible we want to reproduce the physical machine in our virtual machine environment uh, and then use those virtual machines to develop and test our uh, configuration system and then we want to take that configuration system and be able to apply it to the actual physical machines and run the same set of tests to confirm that we've got exactly the same stuff going on on our test environment sorry, development and test environment uh, compared to the actual physical machines now beyond those two machines we will we'll play with some other stuff uh, but basically those two machines are going to be, be the, the main machines we play with on uh, the local area network uh, we will uh, we, we might mess around with some switch stuff um, and, and show how salt can be used to uh, remotely manage stuff maybe uh, but more importantly the next step will then be to look into the cloud and start building servers in the cloud uh, and we'll investigate uh, using different technologies to do that uh, such as uh, HashiCorp's Terraform and uh, Salt itself, Salt Cloud, which is their cloud management system. Uh, and we'll see how we can then integrate uh, the Salt uh, uh, in environment stuff uh, with uh, remote data centers in the cloud, okay, uh, and, and tie the various masters together into a federated system. Uh, so that we don't have to have a permanent connection between our home network and our remote, for want of a better description, uh, uh, what should we call it, D data center, yeah, uh, to our data center. Uh, and we will actually look at how we can set up uh, mirrored systems in that data center so we can have a test system or a series of test systems. So we're going to have one that is used by the continuous integration and uh, deployment system uh, to uh, do the continuous integration and the system testing um, and then we use another one to go to say a pre-production environment so we can confirm that the system works uh, with a, a bigger build out uh, and then finally the production system and at each step we look at how we can uh, see what's coming we can see what we've done uh, we can confirm that our tests are all still passing at each stage and that they're relevant um, uh, even in production where we can say uh, run the run the tests in production uh, to the extent that it's possible uh, uh, and we'll talk about the limitations of what you can and can't do um, uh, so that we can confirm that our end-to-end -end system actually works the way we expect it to okay so uh, right, that's our machine built so let's go Let's have a look at what we've got. Uh, 
Right, so there's our Vagrant Machine, and you'll see that if we uh, list everything out, okay, so we've now got our Bash Profile and our uh, Bash RC, uh, we've got a uh, PG Poetry, PyEnv, got SSH on there, yeah. uh, so we've got, we've got quite a bit of stuff already installed on it. Um, And uh, I can also do things like this. Uh, so PyEnv is already installed. Uh, okay, we can do Python. And if we do uh, PyEnv okay so you can see uh, we've got the system uh, the system version which is 2.7 okay uh, but we can we could have installed our, our own versions uh, as it happens we haven't yet um, but we but we, we we can do that uh, well, what else did we install? Oh, Vim. Yeah, so we can do Vim. And there's Vim. Uh, we've got Tmux, uh, which is a bit tricky because I've got Tmux on here as well. Uh, but you can run Tmux within Tmux. It just becomes a bit awkward because of all the key interceptions. Uh, so let's uh, exit that. Uh, so everything seems to be installed and working as we might expect. So that's good. Okay. So let's. Uh, what should we do now? Oh, let's get uh, let's get rid of that because um, I, I don't really need that at the moment. Do, do, do. Okay, let's go back up a level again. And now, uh, let's have a look at the other virtual machine. Uh, now, unfortunately, for various reasons, I actually put this into a different account. Uh, and... Uh, Hmm. This one. Ah. Uh, just bear with me while I log into this. Uh, and I'm in completely the wrong vault. Okay, so we can see we've got this uh, central repository, and it, it is in actual fact uh, <coughs> empty. And the reason for that is because I'm a dumbass, and 
In actual fact, uh, I haven't yet uh, put this in there. Oh, no, I'm being stupid. Of course, I decided to not work on the master branch. Uh, so you can see this is looking at master. I'm working on the dev branch, and the dev branch has got stuff in it. Cool. Okay. Uh, so if we just get that down, let's... Uh, oops. Uh, and if we do a clone, okay, uh, and go into central. Okay, so. Uh, we've got nothing at the moment because we need to get uh, and okay, so there it is, as if by magic. So we've got a similar sort of setup here uh, where we've got a vagrant file, uh, and the vagrant file uh, in this instance is just running the bootstrap and then doing a reboot okay uh, we may change all of this okay uh, let's okay so you can see this one is written in the straight through style uh, uh, and to some extent this is excusable because this is not really going to do any configuration work. Uh, all this is going to do is set these variables and then th all of this is just about installing this script and running it, uh, which is actually going to get the salt system installed onto this machine. Okay, so in this case, we're going to emulate SVR001. Um, Okay, uh, this little thing here is really just about uh, making sure that the uh, <laughs> okay salt we're setting up salt in a master server setup. Okay, so uh, server one, oh, there you are. Uh, okay, so this server one is going to be the uh, the main server on the on the on the local area network, and server two uh, will be the uh, router device. Now, server one is going to be the uh, salt master, but it will also be a salt minion because it will be used to configure itself. Okay, uh, and only minions do the work of actually altering the configuration of a of a system. So uh, we'll have a master and a minion running on server 1 and on server 2 we'll have uh, just a minion that will connect to this master. Uh, so uh, the first thing we do okay, is uh, we set up the host name to be server 1 which is our main server. Uh, the domain is the LAN domain. Uh, we make the minion identity be the same as our fully qualified domain name. We update and upgrade our system. And as we discussed a, a while ago in one of the other lectures, um, it's debatable whether you want to do that because of uh, the whole point about idempo. Uh, the whole point about, okay, uh, if I run this a second time at a later date, I'm going to get a slightly different result because of these two lines here. Uh, but for the purposes of uh, a development environment where you're doing the initial development, arguably they should be left in because you want to be on the bleeding edge most of the time. Okay, uh, then this line here, right, we've got more of this said magic. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking in the etc. hosts file. Yeah. 
of the host system. Um, what am I saying? I'm full of shit. Uh, no, uh, uh, um, we're looking at the etc. host of the guest system, the one that we are currently bootstrapping. Okay, and we're looking for the file name that we've just created. Okay. Uh, so we're looking for the host names, fully quality quality qualified domain name. Okay, we want we want to make sure that it's all mapped properly. Okay. Uh, oh, excuse me. So what this is doing is it's saying looking at, at the moment. Okay, and we're looking for the current host name, and we're looking to submit to substitute the host name that we are giving it. Now the reason for that is that when Vagrant starts up, it's going to have its own host name the first time the system boots. This script will then be run subsequently. So what this is doing is looking in the etc. Uh, hosts area, okay, and substituting the current host name's fully qualified domain name for the one that we want and similarly the host name with the host name that we want okay now obviously on the if we were to run this provisioning script a second time that line would still run and it would do the substitution but it would be substituting the same things because the host name once it's been reset would be the same as the one that we want if you see what i mean so it's benign it, it is idempotent in that respect Okay, the second thing we do is we put in etc host name, we put the host name we want. Uh, and again, this is uh, partly bookkeeping, but it means that it's going to always be the same thing. Next, uh, next we are looking to see if there is a line that contains the host name salt in the etc host. Why? Because that's the default uh, host name that. Uh, or host that uh, a salt minion will look for. Okay, it will look for uh, salt uh, and try to resolve that uh, to find the master. Uh, so if we don't find that salt entry in etc. hosts, this said command says, okay, find the local host because remember server zero one is the salt host. So we find the line that contains localhost and we set that to be salt in etc. host. It's a bit of a cheat, but it does the job. Okay, what it does is it makes sure that this minion simply connects through the local loop uh, device to itself. Okay. Next, this wget line simply goes and fetches the script that will install our uh, salt system. We make sure it's executable and we execute it with a number of parameters. Now you'll notice here that we're using Python 3. Because we're using Debian 10 we can be pretty sure that Python 3 is installed. If we wanted to be absolutely certain what we would have to do is up here uh, or at least before we ran it we would have to make sure that Python 3 was installed but as it happens uh, I believe the bootstrap script will do that anyway. Uh, so, what do all these hieroglyphics do? Well, this makes sure that the minion name is set to the minion ID that we've asked for, otherwise it will um, make a guess itself. Okay, but we want to explicitly use this minion ID. Stable 3000, make sure the version we install is the correct version. Uh, minus x python 3 make sure that it's actually going to be python 3 and not 2.7 that is used by salt because salt is a python system uh, minus m makes sure that uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, it, it makes sure that the master is installed yeah? the minimum will be installed anyway uh, make sure the master is installed and minus l um, I can't remember what minus L does. Let's have a look. Now this is uh, so salt bootstrap. Now, if I remember, it used to be really, really easy, um, but they they've hidden it away. So you actually have to go and look in the script now. Uh, so. Uh, uh, 
And if I remember correctly, it's right at the beginning of the script. Mm, here we go. So minus capital L, here we go. Ah, okay, we, we're also installing Salt Cloud. Cool, okay, so install Salt Cloud. Now, what we aren't installing is we're not installing Salt Syndic. Uh, we, we don't need that at the moment because we're not going to syndicate this particular salt. Uh, M install some master, yeah, cool. Okay, so basically, yeah, minus L, make sure we install all of the cloud, uh, salt cloud stuff as well. So when we come to want to use it, it's already there. Uh, now, when the salt master and the salt minion start up, okay, um, what we need to do is make sure that the minion. Uh, is up and running and then we need to instruct the master to accept its key now normally uh, on, on a, once the system's up and running uh, you wouldn't want to automate this step necessarily uh, not like this anyway um, because this is a security check it makes sure that you can't have somebody just install a salt minion somewhere and have it connect back to your master uh, as if it belonged there. Yeah? Um, you don't want that. You want to make sure that whenever a, a salt minion attaches to your master for the very first time, you, you explicitly accept its uh, security keys. Uh, and this is a way of ensuring that you don't get sort of rogue minions floating around all over the place. Okay, so automatically, automatically accepting. Uh, is something that you should only do when you're absolutely certain that the conditions mean that it's the only, uh, only legitimate things are going to connect. Now, this virtual machine is running on a local area network. It is isolated. The chances of anybody knowing that you're setting this up are the square root of bugger all. Okay, so this is a, a fairly safe approach. So how do we do it? Well, we could watch for the um, processes to all start and so on. Well, that's terribly complicated. So we do it the easy way, okay? Uh, within etc. salt PKI, okay, the master keeps track of the master um, uh, the minion keys, okay? So what this does is it says, right, if the master has not already accepted the minion key for the minion ID that we've got, then uh, we loop around this loop, okay, sleeping for five seconds each time, uh, and we keep looking for the, the minion key to arrive pre-acceptance, okay, so it will go into this directory of minions pre. Uh, this means that the minion uh, is started, it has sent the master its key uh, to say you know, this is the key that you should use when communicating with me and it, 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 it will make sure that only I see the things that I should see. Okay, uh, So we loop around until that, key, that, that file arrives. When that file arrives we know the minion's up and running and the key has been sent. Okay, so the last thing we do is we check again that that file has arrived and we haven't simply dropped out of this timed loop. Okay, which will go around 15 times 5, so a minute and a bit. Uh, so, yeah, so this checks, okay, if that key has arrived, uh, then we execute salt key acceptance minus YA, which means accept this key uh, for this minion. <coughs> So it's perfectly possible that if it takes more than about a, what is it, a minute and a half, uh, so if it takes more than about a minute and a half, uh, minute and a half, minute and 15 seconds, yeah. uh, if it takes too long, uh, it's possible that it will drop out of this loop and this file won't exist, so the key won't be accepted. Uh, but experience says, the minion doesn't take that long to start up even on a virtual machine okay so that's what that's what all of this nonsense does okay so the only thing we're doing uh, in this 
provisioning script is we're setting up a master and minion on that server right now there is something else that we want to do uh, but we'll get to that because uh, the next step in setting this all up is to set up the salt configuration and what we're going to do is we're going to store our primary salt configuration okay in a repository somewhere uh, most likely in the GitLab repository okay so we'll store our repository uh, uh, and so we're going to have steps in this file which will get that down to our local system so that the salt master can use it unfortunately bootstrapping uh, is going to be a multi-step process and the reason for that is that although we can set up most of the configuration on the salt master as it currently stands uh, without reference to anything else uh, we, we we're going to need uh, the server 2 setup uh, because it's going to become amongst other things our router so to fully set up our networking we need server 2 setup before server 1 but we need server 1 setup first in order to have the salt master so it's going to take it's going to take a bit of coordination Fortunately, Salt will help us with that because there's a way of, of making sure that the various machines are set up uh, correctly in the correct order. Okay, the other thing we're going to need to uh, make sure is that as we set this up, is uh, that secrets become available when they're needed. What do I mean by secrets? Uh, usernames, passwords, uh, uh, certificates, um, uh, the public key infrastructure. Uh, all of that kind of stuff uh, is going to need to be available to the salt master but not necessarily to uh, the minions uh, the salt master will then be responsible for deploying those secrets to the minions but as we'll see there are other ways of achieving this uh, and arguably better ways of achieving it because um, we're going to look at using HashiCorp's vault system for managing a lot of secrets on our system uh, and the reason for that uh, uh, do we leave it until we cover it or do we cover it now well okay I'm not going to cover it in detail now but I'll, I'll give you a few steps ahead okay the vault system uh, has a number of advantages. First of all, it allows us to set the system up such that it will regularly perform uh, key rotations. Uh, not something that is necessary, but it's something that is a good idea for some keys. Not necessarily for all of them. Okay, uh, and there, there are uh, good cases to be made for not rotating some keys regularly. Uh, however, with Vault, uh, you can decide how often those keys are rotated, how quickly they expire, and so on. Uh, so that's one reason for using Vault. Uh, and Salt, bless it, can do these things, but it's not necessarily the best way of doing it uh, for a number of reasons. Not least of all, uh, that Salt is a star configuration, that is the master sits in the middle, and the minion sits uh, are connected around the outside to it whereas vault is a mesh configuration uh, and uh, it's based on their uh, console application which again we will make use of for certain things um, uh, which means that if your network uh, breaks in a particular way it doesn't matter because you're not relying on a single route to get to a central location necessarily so there's that um, but but all of these things are stuff that we'll deal with later in detail the other reason for using vault uh, is it does a lot of the key generation for you automatically which salt doesn't uh, so again uh, salt has certain uh, not necessarily a weakness because salt could use vault directly from the master and then deploy the keys itself so why have a dog and bark yourself if you're going to go to the trouble of using vault for secret management you might as well use all of its facility uh, so yes, so although uh, Salt is very good for a lot of things, and a lot of infrastructure management, there are some things that it's not. 
so good for uh, and this goes for any tool uh, you know um, uh, there, are, there, there are certain things that you know uh, uh, you would would you uh, I would use so for and I, or I wouldn't use so for and again it depends also on your particular um, security concerns uh, some organizations wouldn't let salt through the door. Why? Uh, because it means punching certain holes through file into the firewalls to allow salt to communicate. And although salt does have a um, public key infrastructure, so it's all, all of its communications are encrypted, uh, some organizations don't like the way it does its encryption um, uh, and won't allow it for that reason. Uh, other organizations don't like the idea of minions running on servers all the time uh, and they prefer an infrastructure where uh, it's centralized and doesn't have minions. Well, okay, SALT can run in what's called the SALT SSH, which means that you don't run minions, you just run one central service. Uh, and, in, and in that respect, it's like some other configuration management systems where you have one central master that doesn't run all of the time um, uh, and you just send the configuration out and that's fine for configuration but it breaks uh, um, uh, it, it takes away some of the facility because it's not a full-time infrastructure management system anymore you've just reduced it to basic configuration management okay so that again that's a different way of doing things uh, console and, and vault uh, are fairly robust but again um, you've got to think about it in the context of your security as a whole um, they both require certain ports to be open on your internal network um, and in theory that means that they can be exploited uh, so again you've got to give thought uh, to the way these things are set up again console has facilities for managing parts of your system and it's very good at certain things uh, but it's a, it's another uh, uh, it's, a, it's another dimple on your attack surface with, with your internal network, uh, and the, all of these things become relevant when you start thinking about this. So, you know, you say, well, okay, uh, you, we've got salt that will do this job. Do we really need to add console and vault to do another job uh, on the network as a uh, as a whole? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, again, it depends on your organization's tolerance to risk, uh, how they view risk, um, uh, and uh, how you evaluate particular tools. Uh, now we're going we're, we're gonna to give some consideration to security, but we're not going to be that bothered by punching what I would call secure holes through my network, um, particularly since things like SALT uh, can be used to ensure that our firewalls are configured properly all the time. Uh, you know, they can monitor the firewall on every host and make sure that nobody's dicking around with stuff. And if they are dicking around with it, they can fix it and put it back the way it should be. And this is really useful if, God forbid, you know, you're letting developers actually log on to machines on your production network, which is a big no-no. It shouldn't. Uh, if you want to make a, a, a change to a production machine, then what you should be doing is changing the configuration which gets deployed to the master, which then changes your production system. You, know, you shouldn't be logging on to a production box. There's no excuse for that nowadays. Uh, the, in, in the good old days, uh, people would say, oh, well, you know, I need to log on to check log files well you don't need to do that nowadays because as we'll discover you can centralize all your logging so you don't need to do that you can have logging available and developers will be able to look at it you know on, on secure servers somewhere that are not anywhere near your actual production environment um okay uh, the other reason was to actually look at the way the machine was uh, configured well again if your configuration is as per salt then in theory if you're doing your job properly and you've got it all set up correctly, you should be able to reproduce a, any production server locally so they can check it out without having to log on to production. Um, does that mean you're never going to log on to a production machine? Uh, no, 
there are always going to be edge cases where you're going to find that it's a benefit to log on to production servers. Um, but I would argue that those cases are sufficiently rare if you've got things set up correctly. Uh, they're sufficiently rare that you shouldn't need a developer to do it. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to have an administrator log on, get the information, and report back. Or, worst case scenario, have an administrator log on while the developer looks over his shoulder to verify things. But I would argue that nowadays, if you get things set up properly, uh, you, you, there's no reason for it. Okay. Uh, so where are we? Um, yes, so we've got our uh, system set up. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's try it, shall we? Let's see whether it works. Vagrant up. So the next step in this is for us to uh, create server two and get it configured uh, so that. Uh, Um, yeah, uh, get uh, get the second server configured, and then we'll get them put together on their own local network, uh, and then we'll start looking at um, how we should be closing the door in order to make our system look like the the system, uh, the the real system. Uh, and then we'll start thinking about all the other configuration issues. These are some of the places where we can tidy up this script. You'll notice I use the apt rather than apt get uh, when I'm doing the modules. Um, the apt interface has been available for donkey's years, and yet it's still not considered to be finished. Um, so if you want to avoid those warnings coming out, we need to use apt get uh, instead. So we can tidy up in that respect. We're also going to look at this setup, uh, server setup, because we want to use most of that server setup um, in setting up uh, server two. So the question is, do we have one script that we parameterize to allow us to go server one or server two, um, or do we have two scripts and use a common set of functions to allow us to, to do the setup? Uh, And this comes down also to looking, again, looking down the road. Uh, when we come to do the setup of the physical machines, how are we going to do that? I want to use the same scripts to set up the physical machines as I do the virtual machines. So how does that work? Um, you know, when I, when I 
when I've run the basic install of the via uh, of the final machine, I then have on my stick you know, one or two scripts which I then run on that machine in order that it will kick off the chain of events uh, that will then configure that server. Okay. Uh, The idea behind that, of course, being if anything goes wrong on the local area network, I want to be able to regenerate either of the key servers uh, without having to, you know, stress out about how do I do it, without having to refer to some long-winded document saying, "Oh, this is how you set it all up." Yeah. Uh, the whole point about uh, infrastructure as code. Is precisely that I should be able to go somewhere, get the code, and run it very simply uh, in order to get my server back on its feet again. This actually comes to uh, 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 what, what is it? Uh, it's it's uh, cattle, pets, and snowflakes. Uh, what we really want is cattle. Uh, uh, if we can't get cattle, we want pets. Uh, if we can't get pets, we'll end up with snowflakes. So what does that mean? Right, okay. If you work long enough at any organization, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't I don't care where, uh, even if you're on the most bleeding edge of projects, you know, <laughs> the truth of the matter is that almost any organization that is old enough, uh, you will have what they call snowflakes. It'll either be a piece of snowflake code, or it'll be a snowflake system, or it'll be a snowflake you know, server or collection of servers. Uh, these are bits of your infrastructure, bits of your IT that are so, uh, that they've mutated over the years to such a point that no one dare touch them uh, for fear that they break it, because if they break it, uh, they won't know how to fix it. Okay, uh, you know, there's no way of rebuilding this system. There's no way of constructing this system from scratch in anything like a reasonable amount of time, uh, because it's you know it's either been badly documented or barely documented or not documented at all. Mm -hmm. And these are the snowflakes in your system. These are the things that will you know if you breathe on them hard. Yeah, and I've worked in environments where they've had all kinds of snowflakes. You know, where you've got uh, pieces of the system, uh, pieces of code library that were written you know twenty years ago. Uh, the people who wrote them left, you know, a decade ago. No one dare, you know, question these things. Can't be replaced because they're a key piece of the system. I say can't be replaced. Uh, yeah, people don't want to replace them. They're such a key piece of the system that, uh, and, and so costly to redevelop and debug all over again. You know, and because they work at the moment, uh, the you know, the instruction from uh, on high is just don't go near them. Don't even try to understand it because people have tried and failed. You know, it's driven them mad. I tell you. So. Uh, so I've had I've worked in environments where there's been pieces of code like that. Um, uh, I've worked in environments where there are entire servers where you know people say, well, you know, this server is still running a really old version of the operating system. Why? Why haven't you updated it? Well, uh, we didn't. We didn't even try to update it because if we you know try and it doesn't work, uh, it'll break such a big part of the system that you know it, it, we've just left it alone. Uh, if something goes wrong, we just reboot it. You know that's kind of like the troubleshooting on this server. Now, it, this doesn't mean that you can't replace these servers. The point is that the the problem is this: uh, everyone knows the server basically does what it's supposed to do, uh, and therefore, whenever you say to someone, "Well, you know, we really ought to tidy up and make sure that we can build that server from scratch." 
The problem is that you say, well, yeah, it's going to take us several weeks to analyze it and figure out exactly how it's configured and then to rep replicate that configuration. Then we've got to build it on another server, so you've got the cost of getting another server. Uh, then we've got to test it all against yeah, uh, our existing test systems, if you're lucky enough to have them, in order to verify that what we have built is the same as the old stuff. Then we have to replace it in production so that you know, we can pick it up and they go, well, hang on a minute, when you're replacing production, that means all the data for that period will be on the new machine. What if it doesn't work the way it's supposed to? Uh, you know, what if we have to revert back to the old machine? What's going to happen to all the intermediate data? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and there are lots of reasons for not doing these things in terms of the simple cost benefit. Uh, and for that reason, these things get worse and worse and worse. And over time, they get older and older and they get more out of date. They become a massive security hazard in a lot of cases because they're you know they're so out of date. There are so many vulnerabilities in the system now. But uh, you know you you end up with lots and lots of perimeter protection <laughs> to try and keep people, keep people away from this one sensitive area of your system. Uh, and it's uh, it's just what 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 I would characterise as system entropy. It's it's this gradual reduction. Uh, nowadays, of course, people uh, often refer to this kind of thing as technical debt. Uh, you know, that is, uh, you're, you're not you're not revising upwards, you're, you're developing more and more technical debt. I mean, it's not, the phrase technical debt is used for quite a few things, but, but basically it's entropy. It's the gradual degradation of a system on the basis that you didn't update it because the cost benefit for updating it doesn't seem reasonable at any particular time. And the problem is that it's it's it, it's a it's an increasing sunk cost because the more time goes by without you updating it, the worse that problem becomes. This is why DevOps is so you know, popular or so um, it, you know appealing because you know, you're doing a constant cycle of testing and deployment all the time. You're deploying all the time, yeah? uh, and that's where you try to move from snowflakes up through pets into cattle. Okay, so a pet. A pet is something uh, in your system that is not as delicate as a snowflake. Okay, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not a cat catastrophe if it goes wrong, uh, but, a, but a pet is something that has to be loved and attended to. Okay, um, so it's a, it's a server that you know, it takes a long time for us to build a replacement for. We, we understand it, or we think we understand it, uh, and we do rebuild them from time to time uh, in our test environments, for example. Um, but they have to be done by hand. Uh, it takes time. Uh, it's not something that is done as a matter of course. It's quite a big project to do. Okay, and th these become the pets. Uh, these, are, these are things that we are low to lose, um, on the basis that they take a, a long time for us to replace. What we really want is cattle, because cattle we expect to come and go. Mm. Uh, it's, it's rather macabre actually when you think about it, because the whole reason cattle come and go is because we send them to the slaughterhouse. But quite literally what we're talking about here is a server that is so well understood and so automated in its reproduction, which is exactly what we're aiming at, Okay, uh, that we don't care if something goes wrong with it. You don't try and fix it anymore. You just destroy it and rebuild it from scratch. Yeah. Uh, you might understand the problem, so the rebuild can be modified to get rid of the problem if it were indeed a problem. Yeah. But if it gets damaged in some way, you know, like if a disk fails or some, you know, uh, something fails in the physical server, uh, it's not a big deal. You don't have to go around trying desperately to recover it from backup or anything. You just go, no, just, just blow it away. Rebuild it from scratch. You use the known rebuild system, you know, which shouldn't take more than a few minutes to rebuild the entire system, uh, and and get on get on with your life. Yeah? It doesn't matter. Yeah? Uh, you can go even one step further, particularly with things like Dockerized systems, you know, containerized systems. Rather, I should, shouldn't really say Dockerized, but containerized systems, where they literally, from second to second or minute to minute, are. are they're coming up, going down, coming up, going down, coming up, going down. Yeah, we don't care. Uh, you know, we can run a, a series of web servers, uh, and we don't give a damn which physical hardware they're running on. Uh, 
they just register themselves and we just say right send traffic to that one uh you yeah, know we can we can run um uh, database front ends and it's a bit, bit more tricky with storage systems but basically we can run the front ends for stuff and you know, we don't care we don't care where it's running or or anything like that we, we just say look i want an instance of this web service um who's got it and somebody puts their hand up the machine puts their hand up and says i've got one you're right fine i'll ask you the question uh, that is sort of what these people are aiming for this is what microservice infrastructure is aimed for is the idea that you know you don't you don't care about anything other than the fact you've got some endpoint offering you a service and you send to it and it gives you an answer back and that's it uh, uh, and again you know, those things can exist for a, a matter of seconds you know, they can exist long enough to answer one question and then go away we don't care right okay uh, right so uh, what's happened here uh, you can see here okay that we we're we're running our uh, installs uh, salt's been installed oh look we've got an unaccepted key it's for server one and there it is being accepted so evidently our script ran okay uh, now it runs the reload now why does it run the reload at this point okay um, I've put in a reload uh, which is uh, an extra step okay uh, and the reason I put the reload in is because uh, I want to reboot the machine after it's done all the install and the key acceptance and stuff because it makes sure that the host name and everything is sorted out on the reboot uh, that, that, that's the only reason it just it's just clean so let's uh, log into our new server and well, actually um, Ta -da! right there's our salt master running and uh, yeah. well, that's not very friendly there's our salt minion cool now we don't have any configuration for our master or, or our minion yet so uh, it's not doing anything interesting but at least it's there about doing that earlier mm -hmm. right uh, okay that's it for now uh, now the, the whole point about those those uh, running those scripts is that there's nothing in that setup script at the moment uh, that should cause any difficulties if I run it a second time yeah, yeah sure uh, the Salt Bootstrap script will run again and it will do a lot of stuff, but it's already installed. Um, but it, it doesn't matter; it won't it won't change anything uh, uh, in terms of its functionality anyway. But we're going to do some tidying up. Okay, we're going to tidy it up and we're going to create a server two. Uh, but for now, I think what time is it? Three o'clock. Doesn't uh, matter okay uh, I'm gonna go take a break uh, I may come back in a bit or a bit later today but that's it for now okay I'll see you on the other side <laughs>